Hey everybody, this is Bruce and the Dog on the Floor, and we're going to be talking about Ecto in this module. And we're going to be talking in terms of the concepts in designing Elixir systems with ODP. It's a book I wrote with James Gray. You can check that out. And so the layering system in that book has a mental mnemonic that's do fun things with big loud worker bees. And the first letters in that sentence stand for data functions tests do fun things with big loud worker bees. And the big is boundary lifecycle workers. And the first three elements of that, the data functions tests, that's called the functional core. And the other three, the last three elements of that, the boundary lifecycle workers, they get their name from that boundary layer that typically serves as the API for the system. So that's called the boundary. And so what I'd like to do is talk about Ecto in that context throughout this Groxio setup. So we're going to be dealing with workers only from the standpoint of dependencies. And that's typically going to be true. There might be some cases where we have to break that rule, but mostly if we're starting a process, it's going to be another dependency that manages that process for us. So we don't need to talk about workers in this particular session. We're going to interact with the processes that Ecto creates for us, mainly that repository in the supervisor. So what about that supervisor? Well, I don't really like to think about it in terms of, of supervision. I think about it as in terms of lifecycle. So a supervisor, which is implemented in application.ex in Elixir, is something responsible for starting and stopping, something responsible for detecting failure and restarting. Those are life cycle concerns. So that's the way we're going to label it. And you get that when you do a mix new with the supervisor flag, or you could just create your own application.ex file and, and make sure in your mix, mix.exs that gets triggered. And so in Ecto, we also have deploy time things that we need to do, like seeding the database with data, like creating a configuration that can, that can bind us to the database, like creating the table structure that we need to actually operate. So these, these types of, of tasks will typically be built in EXS files. And, and in fact, that's the first bit of advice that I have for you, that runtime code is going to go in lib and EX directory, so they're going to be compiled. And deploy time code is going to be implemented in one-time scripts that typically go in priv slash repo. And so that's going to allow us to use scripts to execute these scripts from the context of a mix task. And that's important because the mix task is already bound to the application and it knows how to start the supervisors and the, those workers that we talked about in Ecto dependencies that our application needs to function. All right, so let's say that you've actually set up your Ecto application. Maybe you've created it with Phoenix or maybe you've created it some other way and from, from scratch and actually built your Ecto configuration. And we'll show you how to build an Ecto application without Phoenix. So let's say that you actually want to start working on your application. Well, the place that you're usually going to start is in the core. Effectively, you're going to think about the data structures that your application needs that need to be bound to the database. And in Ecto, those are two things. One is going to be the query because Ecto has separated the concept of building a query or building user data and executing that query that generates that user data or executing the query that inserts the data or that data in the form of a chain set into an application. So we're going to do, we're going to build the core first. And as we do so, you should build your queries in their own module. Now there's a lot of Elixir code where there's a ton of query composition that actually happens in the boundary. But one of the things that I like to do is keep that boundary or really those, those contexts that Phoenix generates, keep them really skinny because that's where uncertainty happens. And it takes a lot of energy to manage all of that uncertainty. So if we can keep that area small and keep the corresponding core code 
a little bit heavier, we can spend more times in the areas of Elixir that are more certain. And that means cleaner compositions, prettier code, and really a more maintainable experience. So the next bit of advice that I have for you is to keep the repo calls out of the schema, right? Because the schema should be a place where we are free from uncertainty. And so what that means is that the repo calls or the things that actually insert, delete, update, and, and so forth, all the things that access to the database directly, all those things are going to always live in the boundary. And now you'll see people who are new to Elixir, typically from places like, like Python or Ruby or Java, in, in those places, very often they use persistence frameworks that where the, the schema and the boundary layer are both packaged together. Now, we don't have to do that. We can separate these concepts, and we really should. And if you do, you're going to be a lot happier. Now, what's an example of some code that would go in the schema? So maybe we have a, a user, and the user has an age, but we don't want to put the age in the database because... Well, the age is going to change every year. So what we do instead is we, we build a function in that core layer that knows how to compute the age based on a date of birth, which we then put into the database. Now let's talk about the boundary layer. The boundary layer is the place where uncertainty happens because that's the place we're going to connect the database. In Phoenix, this is the context, but essentially it's what layer that actually calls repo dot, repo dot all, repo dot one, repo dot delete or update or insert or all those things that could potentially change values in the database or call the database in a way that it could potentially fail, which is any call that, that accesses the database itself instead of just working with the data that either came from the database or we plan to put there at some future time. So we're going to be working with errors in the boundary, and there are three types of errors that we can deal with. One is errors related to user data. We're going to call those chain sets. The second type of, of result is going to be called a tag tuple, and it is going to include a status and some, and some other information, depending on either what the result is or what the error is. And my next bit of advice for you is to use tag tuples or chain sets only if the user needs to know the information about it. Otherwise, you should be using something that composes more cleanly, and that's an exception. And so normally what we'll see is, is use of exceptions for things where the database itself might fail, that we really expect this operation to succeed and there is a bug if things have broken. So there's nothing we can do about it except let it crash. And we might translate the error um, with, with a re-raise or something like that. Or we might just let the, the error go through as an exception and then let some other layer of our system make a decision on how to deal with it. The next piece of advice that I have for you is that only the boundary should call the query or schema functions. So an example here is maybe I have a service that wants to call something in functions that's, that's working on the, the data. So if you can at all help it, you should not do this kind of thing because what tends to happen is this is going to increase the coupling in your system. There are going to be many more calls from your services directly to functions than there would be if I restricted these conversations to go straight through the boundary. Right, Because reducing coupling and reducing the dependencies in layers of your systems to only go one layer deep into your layered architecture is going to be a better way to, to design your system and, and to have more success and, and fewer bits of coupling in the long term. So I, I highly recommend this type of access instead of accessing functions from, from the service directly. So those are some of the things that we're going to talk about as we walk through the Ecto module. Now, some of you have asked 
why we're not covering things like individual database mappings and individual database features. Well, I believe that kind of documentation needs to be available for free and that the right place to, to have those conversations is in the excellent forums, the Stack Overflow, and the Ecto documentation itself. These are the places where discussions can help Ecto evolve and where other people can find the solutions and they'll actually help shape the Ecto architecture. Instead, we're going to focus on making your designs better, on actually building things in layers, showing you actually how to, to implement the different pieces of advice that I just gave you, showing you how to build a, an excellent layered system and, and the techniques that you're gonna to use to do so. So we hope that you'll join us at grox.io. You have a couple of options. You can subscribe annually, and that's gonna give you access to everything on our site for 150 bucks a year. It's excellent value. Or if you're just interested in Ecto, you could pay 70 bucks. Either way, you're gonna have a great time. You're gonna find out how to design better Elixir software. And that's really an excellent thing. From Bruce and the dog on the floor, this is Groxio Learning.